My name is Wen Hong Yu. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. I was born in Shanghai in the mid 80s when um, China just you know, embarked on its reforms. It just adopted socialism with Chinese characteristics and it's a diff very different place than it is now. Um, and I immigrated to the U.S. when I was seven um, with my parents. We lived in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, my mom's still there. Um, I mean, I remember, I tell people this. I, I, I tell people that the first modern city I ever saw was Tokyo. Because we had a layover, we had like a 24-hour layover there before, uh, to, before the second leg of our flight to D.C. And that was the first time I saw what a modern city looked like. And people were like, dude, what are you talking about? You, you grew up in Shanghai, you know? Shanghai's a modern city. I'm like, yeah, now it is, but not back in the 80s and early 90s when I was there. So, you know, kind of just to show you um, how quickly things have changed over there. But anyway, um, today I'm going to give an introduction on socialism with Chinese characteristics. And so let's get started. All right, so, you know, just as sort of a background, socialism with Chinese characteristics, I, I shortened it to SWCC because it's kind of a mouthful and kind of long to type out, but it's, it's the official state ideology of the People's Republic of China. And you know, one could argue that it is the most successful form of real existing socialism to date. Um, approximately one-fifth of humanity, 18% of the world's population, live under this system and also um, similar forms of this type of socialism is practiced in uh, three out of the five remaining socialist nations in the world, uh, which includes Vietnam uh, and uh, Laos. So okay, so this is the overall outline. You know, so what is socialism with Chinese characteristics? That's part one. Part two, how is it practiced? And part three, you know, what has it been able to achieve thus far? And so, you know, ultimately, that's the goal, right? I mean, China originally, when the Communist Party first took power, was a semi-feudal, semi-colonial state, very backward, very poor. And the and 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 of course, the the communists weren't the first people to want to build a modern nation for China. But you know, they're the they're the ones that finally got it right. The ones who actually met with some success. And so you know, the goal is a modern nation that's well off, democratic, civilized, and harmonious. And you know, this is kind of what that would look like, right? It's uh, an elderly couple under the banner. Um, it says in Chinese, I love you, China. And, and you can take a look around. You know, you got brand new high rises, you got you know, neon lights and LEDs and people shopping and going to restaurants and having a good time, right? That's that's what socialism should be, right? Is everybody enjoying greater material wealth uh, year in, year out, right? It's not what uh, is often you know, misconstrued by various powers at be in the West, how they consider socialism. That's not you know, where everybody is equally poor and you have no economic opportunities, right? That's, as Caleb said last week, that's not socialism. All right, so what is socialism with Chinese characteristics? Okay, so it's, it's actually a broad term for the set of political theories and policies that are the product of scientific socialism, which uh, Caleb explained to us last week, representing Marxism, Leninism adapted to Chinese circumstances and specific time periods. So this, in a way, it's like a living ideology that's constantly being refined, constantly being updated to adapt to the uh, changing material conditions of the Chinese nation, right? And so you know, it starts out with Deng Xiaoping theory. It was under, really, un under the Deng Xiaoping administration, under his era, that this, the term socialism with Chinese characteristics really took off uh, and really became part of the, uh, the parlance in China. And of course, you know, once he passed, it was on, it went on to uh, Jiang Zemin, who uh, became the paramount leader, and he added, you know, his own outlook, the three represents, which was enshrined 
in the country's constitution in 2002. And then his successor, Hu Jintao, came up with the theory of scientific outlook on development, uh, adopted in 2007. And right now, of course, we are in the era of Xi Jinping and his contribution to Marxist theory in China is Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. So what forms the basis of socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? What, what, what exactly is it trying to do? And what is the, the sort of philosophical, theoretical foundation of it? Well, socialism with Chinese characteristics it, it stipulates that China is in the primary stage of socialism, right? And that is a term that is uniquely Chinese. And Mao was actually the first one to coin that term. Um, and, and it's in the primary stage of socialism mostly because of its relatively low level of material wealth, unlike European countries, uh, unlike North American countries. Um, and, and it needed to engage in economic growth before pursued a more egalitarian form of socialism, which would in turn lead to a communist society, um, as explained in Marxist orthodoxy. So practically speaking, socialism with Chinese characteristics is generally described as a form of socialism that adopts elements of market economics uh, as a means to foster growth using things like foreign investments uh, and to increase productivity while the Communist Party of China retains both its formal commitment to Marxism and its monopoly on political power. Okay, so under that definition, right, what I just said, it, it's adapting Marxism-Leninism to Chinese uh, circumstances for that specific time period. And if you use that definition, really, I mean, who was the first to kind of invent socialism with Chinese characteristics. Did it, did it really start with Deng Xiaoping or did it actually start with Mao, right? Early on in his career as a, as a Communist Party member, I mean, he would get yelled out of meetings for proposing the idea that China should use the vast, the country's vast peasantry as the primary agitators for revolution as opposed to what was then a tiny, tiny proportion of the population that were actually urban proletariat workers, right? I mean, he got yelled out of party meetings for suggesting such a thing. But then, of course, that's what he did, and it was successful, and it brought the CPC to power. So who was it really to adapt Marxism-Leninism to Chinese circumstances? You know, you could argue it was, it was this guy, right? It was Mao, and, and Deng Xiaoping, and everybody who came after sort of used that, used what he did as the foundation, as a stepping stone uh, for the things that came after. And like I said, the primary stage of socialism, right? I mean, that's, like I said, that that's, forms the foundation of the, uh, uh, of the theory behind socialism with Chinese characteristics. And it was actually first coined by Mao uh, at the first Zhenzhou conference in November 1958. But he didn't really elaborate, he just said it. Right? He's like, oh, we're the first, we're the primary initial stage of socialism. And, and that basically means, you know, our, prime, our main job is to grow the uh, economic base um, because we're very poor. But he didn't really elaborate further on that. It, it, and that was left to, left to his successors, uh, namely Deng Xiaoping. So this theory of a primary stage of socialism was eventually developed and used as the theoretical basis for the political report that was delivered to the 13th National Congress held in 1987. And so the theory, what is the main focus, right? Uh, it's, you know, keep saying it again and again, is to develop the productive forces in China because China was just so poor. Um, and it was also a way to, you know, reconceptualize socialism to make Marxism fit for contemporary use for, for that particular time period. Um, especially since by the 80s, the, the socialist mission or the socialist project in Eastern Europe was starting to fail. And I think Chinese leaders, the leadership knew that. And they had to find a way to have socialism succeed in China and not go the way of what happened in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. So, you know, party theorists, they said, 
okay, the primary stage of socialism in China is going to last for a long time, right? It started when, when the CPC, when the revolution uh, succeeded in 1949, uh, and it's going to last about 100 years, right? Okay, well, 2049 is actually not that far off now. <laughs> Uh, the, the PRC is uh, about to celebrate its 70th anniversary uh, in just the next couple of weeks. So, you know, the previous Maoist emphasis on economic equality over economic growth was abandoned. The primary mission then was to grow the economic base, how to grow the pie as opposed to divide up the pie. Okay, so this is what Deng Xiaoping said in 1984. What is socialism and what is Marxism? We were not quite clear about this in the past. Marxism attaches utmost importance to developing the productive forces. We have said that socialism is the primary stage of communism and that at the advanced stage, the principle from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs will be applied. This calls for highly developed productive forces and an overwhelming abundance of material wealth. Therefore, the fundamental task for the socialist stage is to develop the productive forces. The superiority of the socialist system is demonstrated in the final analysis by faster and greater development of those forces than under the capitalist system. As they develop, the people's material and cultural life will constantly improve. One of our shortcomings after the founding of the People's Republic was that we didn't pay enough attention to developing the productive forces. Socialism means eliminating poverty. Pauperism is not socialism, still less communism. All right? So, I mean, he, he, spells, he spells it out very clearly, right? Primary mission is to grow the productive forces in China. And that's one of his famous phrases, right? Poverty is not socialism. That's where it comes from. Okay, but still, there's still a commitment to socialism. And that is what Deng Xiaoping outlined in 1979, the four cardinal principles, right? And what are they? Okay, the first is the principle of upholding the socialist path. Two, the principle of upholding the people's democratic dictatorship. Three, the principle of upholding the leadership of the Communist Party of China. And four, the principle of upholding Mao Zedong thought and Marxism-Leninism. So these four these four cardinal principles are not up for debate, right? That's kind of like, it's kind of like the Constitution, of the United States of America, right? Like, you can interpret what the Constitution says, you can interpret what each of these four cardinal principles actually mean, but you can't do something that goes against the spirit of these two, or these four principles. Um, but, you know, conversely, it also means outside of these four cardinal principles, people have a lot more leeway, right? You know, it doesn't go into great detail about, okay, what, what should you do as an individual, right, to promote socialism? What, what should you do in your private life? Or what should you do in your professional life? None of that. It, so it kind of, in a way, it, the state, the party step back from a lot of things that are traditionally thought of as a socialist state. So, there's that as well. While taking into account, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? The first part is socialism. So we saw just from the four cardinal principles, the commitment <coughs> to socialism. While taking into account Chinese circumstances. All right, so socialism with Chinese characteristics normally associated as beginning 1978 when Deng Xiaoping uh, took power and became paramount leader. Okay, so what was China like in 1978? All right, GDP per capita, $156. Low three digits. I mean, that's pretty crazy to think about, right? Like, how do you survive on $156 a year, right? Now, compare that with the USSR. The Soviet Union at that time, per capita GDP, $4,400, $4,430, 28, more than 28 times that of the People's Republic of China. The US, more than $10,000 per capita GDP, all right? More than 67 times that of China. And then also, you know, like these are pretty, you know, GDP per capita, pretty abstract numbers, right? Well, let me put it to you in more concrete numbers. 
number of automobiles per 1,000 persons. I couldn't find a figure for all of China. I did find a figure for Beijing, the capital city, which one would expect to be like, you know, one of the most advanced uh, cities in the country. 0 0.009 automobiles per thousand persons. All right, per thousand people, you had what, like point, not even 0 0.01 automobiles, okay? 1.05 television sets per thousand persons. And then 2.18 telephones. We'll come back to these numbers later, all right? We'll take a look at just how things have changed. But, but this is China, this was China in 1978. And so I show you some, you know, I show you some pictures for comparison, right? I, I'm pretty sure you can tell this is, this is China. And like everybody's like, really, I mean, back then everybody was kind of wearing the same thing. Everybody's, you know, riding a bike. You don't see any cars. You see some buses in the background. You don't see any cars. Uh, far, you know, the far right, um, where's that? It says Radio City. It's right across from where I work right now. This, that was America. That's New York City, 1978, right? Not, not too different. I mean, the car models are a little bit older. The people's fashion is a little bit different, but more or less the same. People, you know, dress very fashionably, very colorful. Um, there are lots of cars on the roads. A lot of economic activity going on, right? So not that different than now. You know where that is? It's Moscow. Moscow, 1978. Looks pretty modern too, right? At least compared to China. Got plenty of people on the street, dressed fashionably. Plenty of cars. Right? So, I mean, China, very, very backward back then, 40 years ago. Very, very poor. All right. And finally, incorporating Chinese characteristics. So, China was materially very poor in 1978, right? But China is a 5,000 year old civilization. Culturally, it's very rich. And so, you know, what are some of the things, you know, some of the cultural inheritances of Chinese civilization, right? So Confucianism is one of them. I mean, Confucianism, not just in China, but it, it, it forms the sort of cultural uh, basis of many countries that have been influenced by China over the centuries, including Japan, Korea, Vietnam. So during the Cultural Revolution, right, Confucian, Confucianism, you know, and, that, and, and for a good amount of period before that was, was very much criticized. But then eventually, you know, the party came around and thought, you know, a lot of these, not, not all aspects of Confucianism are bad. And it's really like you can't blame Confucianism for everything that happened in China, to China during the century of humiliation, right? There are a lot of good principles within Confucianism that can be used, that can be harnessed, incorporated into socialism with Chinese characteristics. Because one of the things you realize if you ever go to China, or these other you know, Confucian-based countries, is that this cultural, this cultural uh, heritage, right, this philosophy runs very deep. And despite what happened during the Cultural Revolution, you're still not able to get rid of it. It's just, it's so ingrained in the way that Chinese people think and act. So instead of fighting it, why don't we harness it? And that's like a recurring theme of socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? Some things, you, I mean, there's certain core principles, you gotta just put your foot down, this is not gonna happen. But a lot of other things, maybe it's more productive to harness it, right? Like harnessing foreign capital, like harnessing market economics, instead of just trying so hard to fight it and keep it out. So what are some of the core principles of Confucianism? Rationalism, social harmony, humanism, secularism. All right, China is often Chinese civilization is often described as perhaps the only major civilization in human history uh, that is not religious. Right, Confucianism is a humanistic secular philosophy. It's very different from other parts of the world where a religious philosophy forms the sort of cultural foundation of that civilization. China has never happened in its history. Confucianism and also Taoism uh, are not, they're not religions. They're more, they're humanistic philosophies. And, um, you know, well, Confucian, the, the major thing about Confucianism is how it treats human interaction. 
all right? And, and it considers you know, ordinary human activities, especially human relationships, as a manifestation of the sacred because they are the expression of humanity's moral nature which has a transcendent, transcendent anchorage in heaven and it holds through an appropriate respect for the gods, right? So what that means really is, well, how do you, how do you, you know, worship heaven, right? How do you worship the gods? Is it just by believing? Is it by like communicating directly with your maker, right? Through, with, your, with the almighty? No. It, you demonstrate that through the way you carry yourself, through the way you interact with other people, through your actions, not your beliefs. It's very, very different, right? Than, than most Western religions, which is what you believe in, that's the important thing. What you, I mean, what you do, yeah, that's important too, but belief comes first. Confucianism is like, no, like, no, no, no. The way you demonstrate your connection with heaven, with the gods, is through your actions with other human beings, all right? And so some of the things in Confucianism, uh, the five constants, benevolence, righteousness, ritual, knowledge, integrity, to this day, still foundations of, of Chinese society, right? And, and by ritual, I don't mean like some, you know, elaborate, you know, ritual, religious ceremony. No, this is just, it, it's, it's just a word for human interaction, right? Like, when I come and shake your hand, right? I come shake, that's a ritual, all right? When you bow, that's a ritual. Like how you interact with other people, that's, that's a ritual. Um, and then the four virtues, right? Loyalty, filial piety, right? Respect for your elders, for your parents, for people who, who are more aged than you. Frugality, righteousness. And then the five bonds. The ruler, subject, father, son, husband, wife, elder, junior, friend, friend. All right, that's also a core tenet of Confucianism. And, and it says, you know, you have responsibilities on each side, right? Yeah, the, the, the junior position, right? A subject is supposed to obey the ruler, but the ruler has, it, he has the responsibility to take care of his subjects. And, and that goes through all of these, you know? So again, something that reverberates through Chinese uh, civilization. And so Voltaire said this about Confucius. So, okay, so he said, Confucius had no interest in falsehood. He did not pretend to be prophet. He claimed no inspiration. He taught no new religion. He used no delusions. Flattered not the emperor under whom he lived. All right? Then another important philosophy in China is Taoism, right? What are some core principles of Taoism? Compassion, moderation, humility. And the yin yang, the concept of dualism, right? All right, so, so, you know, within, within the white you have the black, within the black you have the white. Like everything has its equal and opposite. You can't el completely eliminate the one and just have the other, right? And in a way, it's kind of like the Marxist uh, concept of contradiction, which Mao says. Mao actually said all, everything, everything that's in existence Right? In his essay on contradiction, everything in existence is a product of contradiction. And then there's also the concept of Wu Wei, action through inaction. And you also see that play out um, in some of the things that China does, right? Some of, the, some of the aspects of socialism with Chinese characteristics. China has never been a missionary civilization, it has never tried to send people far and abroad to spread its civilization, right? That's something that Western civilizations do. The Abrahamic religions, right? That's part of that missionary uh, zeal, right? It's to go and spread the faith these days, it's go and spread democracy, right? Uh, around the world, capitalism, democracy around the world. Well, China does not have that sort of tradition. And as a matter of fact, you go to China today, you talk to a, a, a CPC member, and you're like, does China want to propagate socialism with Chinese characteristics? And they say, no, absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's all written right there. It's socialism with Chinese characteristics. It's socialism adapted for China, right? And then also, what is socialism? Socialism is about generating material wealth, right? Who cares what labels you put on it, right? Like if, if 
American capitalism is better at generating wealth, then maybe you should go with that, right? But is it these days? Definitely not, right? <laughs> Definitely not. So, you know, it, it, it's the concept of, you know, if you just do the right thing, then people will come to you. You don't have to go far and abroad to try to push your agenda, push your ideology onto other people, right? And that sort of, again, ties back to traditional Taoist theory and philosophy. And then the Confucian concept of Xiao Kang and Da Tong. So Xiao Kang is actually very popular, well, a little less popular now, but very pop. It was popularized by uh, President Hu Jintao during his administration. He said, you know, the the goal, his goal, right, was to create a Xiao Kang society. And what does that mean? It means, you know, lesser prosperity, a moderate, a moderately prosperous society, in which the people are able to live relatively comfortably, albeit ordinarily, right? Not super rich but comfortable. You don't have to worry about being hungry. You don't have to be worried about being sick. You don't have to worry about you know, putting clothes on your back or a roof on your head, right? That's, that's the first main goal, all right? Is, is, to, is to get to Shao Kang society. Concept, again, that dates back to the 11th to 7th century. It first came in the, uh, in the Shijing, the classic of poetry. So thousands of years ago, this concept has been there thousands of years. In the modern era, it's first used by Deng Xiaoping, and then, like I said, um, eventually popularized by President Hu Jintao, uh, who used the concept to promote the creation of a harmonious society that would balance economic growth with social equality and environmental protection. Because it was during his administration that some of these problems, some of these signs, some, you know, started to show. Right, Chinese society with the growth with rapid economic growth was becoming increasingly unequal, and then there was also increasing amounts of environmental degradation. All right, so what comes after Xiao Kang? Well, what comes after Xiao Kang is a period called Da Tong, the Great Unity. And this concept first appeared in the Lian chapter of the Li Ji, the Book of Rights, which dates the Warring States period, which is uh, approximately 475 to 221 BC. Again, thousands of years. This concept has been there for almost more than 2,000 years. And it, it's the way that this concept is presented in the Li Qi is, um, you know, one of Confucius's disciples, right? If you read any of the Confucian classics, it's usually one of his disciples talking to Confucius and you know, getting trying to get his wisdom. So this story goes, one of his disciples sees Confucius pacing back and forth very nervously, and he asks, why? Well, he's, Confucius responds, well, I don't think I'm going to live to see Da Tong. I don't think I'm going to live to see the great unity, right? And so his disciple asks him, well, you know, master, what do you mean by the great unity, right? And this is what he says. When the grand course was pursued, a public and common spirit ruled all under heaven. They chose men of talents, virtue, and ability. Their words were sincere, and what they cultivated was harmony. Thus men did not love their parents only, nor treat only their own sons as their children. A competent provision was secure for the aged, till their death, employment for the able body, and the means of growing up to the young. They showed kindness and compassion to widows, orphans, childless men, and those who were disabled by disease, so that they were all sufficiently maintained. Males had their proper work, and females had their home. They accumulated articles of value, disliking that they should be thrown away upon the ground, but not wishing to keep them for their own gratification. They labored with their strength, disliking that it should not be exerted, but not exerting it only with a view to their own advantage. In this way, selfish schemings were repressed and found no development. Robbers, thieves, and rebellious traitors did not show themselves, and hence the outer doors remained open and were not shut. This was the period of what we call the Great Unity. So, comrades, like, what does that sound like to you, right? It sounds like, I mean, does anybody care to? Communism. It sounds like ultimate communism, right? It's like, it sounds like the end stage of communism, a paradise on earth. This idea, and of course, Confucius is not the only ancient philosopher to write about the ideal world, right? I mean, a lot of like Plato, a lot of a lot of Western philosophers, Middle Eastern philosophers, had the same idea. 
That has always been the goal. I would argue it's always been the goal of mankind is to reach this sort of society, right? Where everything is in abundance. People don't have to worry. People treat each other with respect. And, you know, that's why they call it the great unity. So that this concept has been there for thousands of years. And to, to, to think that, oh, like capitalism, this ultra-competitive dog-eat-dog system is the end-all and be-all of human civilization, I think that's a load of BS, all right? Because ever since the beginning of human civilization, this is what mankind has been striving for. Not this chaotic, rich gets richer, poor gets poor sort of society, all right? So then I come to the two centenaries. The first is coming up in the next you know, two years from now. Uh, the centenary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. Uh, that is the deadline for which Shao Kahn society full, has been fully achieved. And what does that mean? Objectively, a doubling of the 2010 per capita GDP figures, which I think has already been accomplished. Has already been accomplished. Because I think in 2010, China's per capita GDP was about $4,500. The estimate, the estimate for this year, 2019, is a little over 10,000. So that's already been reached. But also, you know, it's not just about numbers, right? I mean, the US has very high GDP numbers, but then there are also a lot of people who are homeless. There are a lot of people who are, you know, working three, four jobs just to put a roof over their heads, right? Like, the GDP numbers are skewed by, by the ultra rich. What it also means is making sure, and that's one of the primary platforms of President Xi Jinping is to eliminate poverty. Eliminate poverty objectively by 2021. Nobody in China will be poor according to the World Bank UN standards for poverty. All right? And then is the next centenary. 2049, the 100th anniversary, the founding of the People's Republic. And so, you know, as you saw earlier, the goal by 2049, is the complete transformation of China into a socialist country that is strong, democratic, civilized, harmonious, modern. Probably also means the full incorporation of Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan into the PRC as well. I, I definitely see that happening. I mean, the the uh, the 50 year sort of you know capitalist system, Hong Kong that expires in 2047, Macau 2049, and I think China's going to take back Taiwan one way or another by 2049. All right. Uh, Although, although the term Datong is not used to define the end goal of China's socialist transformation, um, it's not that difficult to see that, you know, maybe 2049 is, yeah, and, and of course, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, they're very, they're very conservative in that manner, right? They don't try to over-promise. They rather, you know, under-promise and over-deliver. So they're not going to say, oh, we're going to have Datong. We're going to have real existing communism by 2049. But one could think maybe that's the goal. Right in the back of their mind, they're thinking maybe, maybe that's what they what maybe that's what they're planning on having. It's by the hundredth anniversary of the People's Republic, there would be so much material wealth in China that you can actually get to that point. And with you know with all the new technologies coming out, right, like artificial intelligence and automation, as Caleb said last week, uh, in America, in a Western capitalist society, that's absolutely devastating, right? It means millions of people, tens of millions of people are going to be out of a job. But in a socialist country, what does that mean? It means, oh, everybody only has to work 12 hours a week, right? You know, let the machines do all the work. We're just going to hand out stuff to everyone because there's just so much of it to go around. There's so much wealth to go around, right? I mean, that's, that's what communism is, and that's what the Confucian concept of Datong is, right? Okay. So how is socialism with Chinese characteristics practiced, part two? So how, how is it practiced? How does it work in modern day China? For that, we go back to the four cardinal principles, all right? And I put a little uh, graphic of core socialist values. You can see that like plastered all over the place in China. And this one is, there's Chinese, but there's English translation down below too so you can kind of see and and the top row it says you know this it means country this means society this means citizen All right, so this is what the country 
should be like, this is what society should be like, this is what an individual citizen should be like. All right, so again, the four cardinal principles. First one, the principle of upholding the socialist path. So what is socialism, right? I mean, that's, like I said, that's, that's kind of hotly debated in China. All right, so these days it means combining, creating a, a socialist market economy. It's combining market economics with central planning. It's not one or the other. You can have both, right? Turns out some things it's better when you have a plan. Some things are better when you have a market, right? Especially for like consumer goods. I mean, that's one of the issues with, with the Soviet Union, right? How, how does like a central planner in Moscow know how much stuff, what type of stuff to produce, what people would like, what people would use? Like you can't, it's very difficult. Maybe with AI we'll, we'll get there, right? But for human beings at least, it's very difficult to get to that level of detail through planning. So the Chinese Communist Party said, okay, yeah, we're not going to plan for that. We're going to let the market sort that out. But for larger things, right? The overall development of the economy, policies, and strategic industries such as energy, banking, utilities, transportation, arms, metals, chemicals, shipbuilding, telecommunications, healthcare, construction, all those more or less still planned, centrally planned, and dominated by state-owned enterprises, right? So when someone says, oh, China's not socialist, China's capitalist, well, if the government owned all of these industries and regulated, controlled all these industries in the United States, do you think these right-wingers would be like, oh yeah, that, that's, that's still capitalism. No, man, they'd be jumping up and down, saying this is socialism, right? Can't have the government controlling these things. I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to get universal health care in this country, and the right-wing types are jumping up and down saying that's socialism, right? So how then are, are they gonna, are, how then are gonna call this Chinese capitalism, or capitalism with Chinese characteristics, or whatever, whatever they want to say, right? Like, how, how, how is it that the government <coughs> controls all these industries and somehow still capitalist, right? I think Caleb says this a lot. It's because China is so successful and they want to associate economic success with capitalism. They, they want to associate economic failure with socialism, right? That's like a deliberate you know, framing of, of ideology of, of present circumstances. But, you know, kind of, if you just kind of peel back, take a step back and look at what's actually happening. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous, right? Oh, and by the way, only the state can outright own land. No individual, no private enterprise in China can own land. The most you can get, 70 years, 70 years of use rights, all right? Again, this is to prevent, you know, a sort of a hereditary oligarchy from developing. Can't own land in China to this day. So here's another quote. 1975 from Deng Xiaoping, Marxism holds that within the contradictions between the productive forces and relations of production between practice and theory and between the economic base and the superstructure, the productive forces and the economic base generally play a principal and decisive role. Whoever denies this is not a materialist. Again, going back to the principle, we have to grow the productive forces. That's the primary goal of socialism with Chinese characteristics. The principle of upholding the people's democratic dictatorship. Do you guys, do you guys, are you guys familiar with that term? People's democratic dictatorship? I mean, to like the average American, that sounds very strange, right? I mean, how do you have a democratic dictatorship? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's an oxymoron, right? Well, I mean, that's the, the, the reason why it's called that is because, um, it's not your classic dictatorship of the proletariat, in that China recognizes it's in the primary stage of socialism, right? You're still gonna have classes, you're gonna have different classes of people, and you guys know, like the, the Chinese flag, right? The PRC flag, you guys know what the stars represent? Anyone? Classes. Yeah, the four classes. The, four, the, the, the big star represents the Communist Party, the four smaller stars represent the four classes uh, uh, the four revolutionary classes in China, which are the, the, pro, the workers, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie, and the national capitalists. Those are the four classes that contributed 
to the Chinese Revolution. All right. So it means that the, the CPC, the PRC, they, they act and they represent on behalf of all Chinese classes, these four classes, right? Uh, but in the preservation of the dictatorship of the proletariat. So they can possess and can use their dictatorial powers to fight against reactionary forces. And we know, I mean, like, it's ever, since, ever since the October Revolution in, this, in Russia, Right and up to this present day, I mean, reactionary forces are always, always trying to stamp out socialism. Right? I mean, the, the trade war is the latest example. Right? And inciting rioting in Hong Kong, another example. I mean, I read an article today. Nancy Pelosi apparently is going to bring that Hong Kong Democracy Act or whatever to a vote. Right? You're like, and this is a supposed left winger in America. Right? wanting to stamp out real existing socialism in 21st century, all right? So, you know, why is dictatorial control by the party necessary? It's to prevent the government from regressing into a dictatorship of bourgeoisie, right? AKA liberal democracy, what we have right here in, in the Western world, right? Yeah, you can, you can vote, yeah, you can complain about, you know, you, you, leaders, you know, politicians or whatever, but at the end of the day, does it actually do anything? Is there a real difference, right, between Republicans and Democrats? The people who are in charge, right, they all serve the same master, and that master is capital. And that's what China is trying to prevent, all right? I mean, we saw what happened to the Soviet Union, right? I mean, Gorbachev was foolish enough to believe all the stuff being sold him by the U.S. by Reagan, by Chicago uh, economics uh, PhD types, and he thought, oh yeah, you know, we can actually improve this system, we can improve the socialist system by incorporating these Western uh, uh, capitalist, liberal, democratic principles and ideas. And what actually ended up happening? It was the dismantlement of the socialist project in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, right? A reversion to a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Right? You have oligarchs with billions of dollars right, that are looting national resources, especially during the 90s uh, under, under Yeltsin uh, in Russia. And, and you know, that's what China's trying to prevent. Right? Imagine if Tiananmen Square, right, if the, 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 the CIA and backed students at uh, Tiananmen Square had succeeded, what do you think would have happened to China? Probably the same thing that happened to the Soviet Union. Dismember, life expectancy going down, you know, infant mortality going up, GDP taking like a 50% nosedive, right? Like, the Great, let me just, the Great Depression, let me put this into perspective. The Great Depression here in the US, all right? GDP dropped by 23% from peak to trough. So you can imagine how bad things were in Russia after uh, the, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. GDP dropped by 50%. And it's crazy, right? So, I mean, is that, is that really like what, what the West is trying to sell China, right? Oh, you know, we want you to be a democratic society, a democratic society, just like us, right? And what we actually mean is this dismemberment of your country, the looting of your natural resources, and like a 50% implosion in your GDP. Okay, Communist Party of China says, no, sorry. <laughs> we're, not, we're not gonna go that route. You're not gonna sell us on this. And what does democracy mean to the Communist Party of China, right? What, is demo what does real democracy mean? It means the ability of the masses to affect real policy changes for the benefit of the majority of citizens, right? A couple of examples. Poverty eradication, right? Like I said, one of the sort of byproducts of such breakneck economic growth uh, especially during the 90s and 2000s, was rising inequality. And of course, that was kind of, uh, it was a, a deliberate decision by Deng Xiaoping, because he recognized, well, you know, in order to grow the productive forces, he said, some people have to get rich first, right? If we're gonna take a different path, we're not gonna be so worried about dividing up the wealth and just growing the wealth, well, of course, some people are going to be richer than others. So let some people get rich first. But the implication is, these people who got rich first 
are then gonna have to help other people, the people who got left behind, get rich too. And you're starting to see that. I mean, we have seen that for the last couple of years. I mean, that is a very core fundamental platform of President Xi Jinping is poverty alleviation. Urban poverty, I believe, has already been eliminated in China. I was just, I was in China just a couple weeks ago. I did not see a single homeless person in both Shanghai and Beijing. So very, very different than what you're used to within any major American city, right? Environmental protection. Again, breakneck economic growth, you know, damn torpedoes, full speed ahead. The only thing we're concerned about is GDP growth, growing wealth, growing productivity. Well, a lot of the environmental protections, right, didn't, didn't keep pace with economic growth. And so you have <coughs> polluted air, polluted water, polluted soil, and it was creating real issues, right? I remember just uh, as recently as you know, two or three years ago, you go to Beijing, especially during the winter, like I had this app that would tell you what the air quality was. And on several days, and it has like this little face, right? Like, be like smiling if it's good, or like, you know, mm, just neutral expression if it's okay, like a little frowny face is bad. Some days, like the guy, the little, little smiley face had a full gas mask on. Like, that's how bad it was, all right? When I was there a couple weeks ago, blue skies every day. Blue skies every day in Shanghai, blue skies every day in Beijing. And, and I mean, granted, it is the summer, so there's less use of coal for, for heating, for energy production. But still, I mean, I, re I remember going back uh, during the summers and there was just dust and smog everywhere. In just a couple of years, that's gone now. I mean, like, if you put, like, if human beings put our minds to it and put all of our efforts towards solving a problem, it doesn't take very long to solve it. Anti-corruption campaign. Corruption, again, when you have political power and you have this new rise of a new, you know, property rich sort of quasi-bourgeoisie class, right? You're gonna get some corruption issues, all right? Every country has it. I mean, in, in America, it's, it's so ingrained now that you pretty much legalized it, right? I mean, just, it's not, it's not even illegal anymore. Um, Corruption, huge issue uh, before President Xi came to power. And, you know, the, these things, right? Like poverty eradication, environmental issues, corruption. I would say 10 years ago, it's 2009, most Chinese people would be thinking there's no way this issue would get solved within our lifetime. Like it's so bad. I mean, these things are so bad and they're so ingrained in Chinese society that I don't think it would get solved within our lifetimes. 10 years later, it's gone, right? And I'm not, and I'm not saying it, like the environment's perfect, I'm not saying there's no corruption anymore, but you ask you know, a Chinese person now, right? Do you think there's corruption? And they said, yeah, maybe there probably still is a little bit going on, but how does it compare with five or 10 years ago? They're saying, oh, it's so much better, you know? It's so much better. And you know, President Xi, one of his things is, hey, look, if you if you want to serve the people, right? You join, you become a civil servant, be a bureaucrat, be a party cotter. If you want to get rich, there are avenues where you can get rich in Chinese society, right? Go be an entrepreneur, all right? Or, or you know, start a business, or you know, go work for the private sector. There are ways for you to get rich, and that are legal, right? That's okay. What's not okay is for you to become rich through illegal means. That's not okay. And you know what? If you do that, we're gonna throw you in jail. Since President Xi came to power, over a million, a million corruption cases have been opened. I mean, how many corruption cases do we see get open here in the US? I don't know, zero? Never heard of it happening, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, and you know the, the image of the, the the image of the party, which was really kind of uh, in a precarious state, I would say about a decade ago. I mean, it's, it's been a complete change. 
a complete you know turnaround and people have more faith in the party to do the right thing and and this is you know this is real democracy right this is real this is people voicing their concerns and and it turns into real policy changes whereas over here it's people say we've been complaining about the same issues for decades now right i mean if you listen to like what bernie sanders said 30 years ago it's the same thing like those problems have been with us for decades now and they still haven't been solved right in china it took only one decade to, to pretty much solve all these problems right that's that's real democracy and so you know at the end of it what does that mean you know we're taught that you know one party state it's by definition, it's going to be corrupt, it's going to be repressive, anti-democratic, people are not going to have any say, right? But we act, what we're actually seeing is, in China at least, a one-party state is more responsive and it, it, it actually is more accountable than a liberal democracy, where you can over-promise, under-deliver, and then just blame it on the other party, right? I mean, that's like, we're, we're used to that by now. I mean, we're, we're used to, we're, I mean, it's so commonplace. That's what we expect from our politicians, is to lie when they're on the campaign trail, do nothing but serve corporate interests once they're in office, and then when anything bad happens, they just blame the other side for being obstructionist or whatever, right? And then of course, you know, that's not just us. That's every liberal democratic society in the world right now has the same problem. You go to Taiwan, right? Oh, it's held up as a paragon of Asian democracy or Chinese democracy, right? Do nothing, no, nothing there gets done, all right? Ever since they transitioned to democracy about 25 years ago, I mean, the, that, that island has just plateaued in terms of economic growth, all right? And then compare it with China, compare it with Singapore, right? China has modeled a lot of its policies behind Singapore, right? And you're saying, oh well, but Singapore is a capitalist society. Yeah, they call themselves capitalist, but you take a look at what they actually do, right? Trust me, what they do, if they try to do that here in America, they, we would call it socialist, especially like the Republicans would call it socialist. And what do they do? They, first of all, they offer universal health care. Second of all, they offer every citizen who wants it, who meets, you know, who fall under a certain income threshold, low income housing. And it's like good quality, low income housing for every citizen in Singapore. Something else that they do is force integration because Singapore is a, is a multicultural, right? I mean, it's dominantly, it's predominantly Chinese. I think the population is 70, 80% ethnic Chinese, but you have a lot of, you have Malays, you have Indians, you have people all around the world. Uh, you know, because it was it was a former British colony. Um, they what they do is forced integration. What does that mean? Each neighborhood, you have to have a certain percentage of Chinese, a certain percentage of Indian, a certain percentage of Malay, a certain percentage of other races and ethnicities. They force people to live together and interact on a daily basis. And by interacting with people on a daily basis, you realize, hey, maybe they're not so different from me. They have the same problems as me, they have the same aspirations as me, and you know what? Culturally, they might be a little different, they might look a little bit different than me, but at the same, uh, at the end of the day, we're all human beings, right? It's radically different from what we have in the US, right? Every, in every city you go in the US, you have the more affluent, predominantly white neighborhoods, then you have, you know, the minority neighborhoods that are usually a lot poorer. You have a Chinatown, right? I mean, it's it, it's it's segregated in every in every American city. It's all it's 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 all segregated. And so, you know, if our government tried to do that here in the U.S., what do you think? What do you think it'd be called? Oh, it's downright communist. You can't do that, right? So yeah, Singapore, you know, they call themselves capitalists, right? But a lot of things they do, hey, look, you know, China's like, yeah, actually, you know, that's actually, that sounds a lot like socialism to us. And again, China is, again, the, the primary goal 
is growing productive forces, social harmony. What, it, what, what you call it is not important. It's how, it's how you get there, right? It's what policies you institute to get to that goal. The principle of upholding the leadership of the, Chi of the Communist Party of China. So the Communist Party of China currently has over 90 million members. It's larger than the population of Germany. Uh, actually, it's the second largest political party after the BJP in India. Because India, I think, they're about to overtake China in, over in overall population within the next couple of years. But here's the makeup. 26 million peasants, 7.2 million blue-collar workers, 12.5 million white-collar workers, 9 million government workers, and then 7.4 million party commoners, full-time employees of the Communist Party of China. And I know like these, they, they, these numbers don't actually add up to 90 million, but this is just kind of like a, some of the subcategories of party members. Uh, the Communist Party only accepts the best of the best with an acceptance rate of less than 10%. It's like trying to get into Harvard. All right, that's how competitive it is. It's well known. President Xi was only admitted into the party on his 10th attempt. He tried 10 times. He rejected the first nine times. And this is the president we're talking about here, right? The paramount leader. And his father was, one of, was a high-ranking first-generation revolutionary. All right, but that didn't help him, you know? Um, the, this, this I found on, on Quora. Uh, somebody asked, you know, one of the questions asked was, uh, you know, what is it like or how do you join? What's the process like for joining the Communist Party of China? Um, oh, no, this is, this is from an article. Sorry. Uh, the next couple of stories are from a core article. And this, this one young party member said, joining the party is not easy. Of the 40 students in my class, only five were admitted. Right? That's like one-eighth of this class. Uh, he credits his admission to his top-notch grades, student government positions, and willingness to help his classmates, which earned him a strong reputation, right? So, again, you're seeing some of these traditional Confucian ideas, all right? Sort of being, you know, melded into the modern Communist Party of China. The, you know, qualities such as integrity, right? Qualities such as you know a work ethic, knowledge, right, studying hard. These are all things that the Communist Party looks for before they decide to admit someone. So according to uh, the Constitution of the Communist Party of China, members must follow orders, be disciplined, uphold unity, serve the party and the people, and promote the socialist way of life. Um, local party committees, so you know. At the very top, right? You have the, the paramount leader, then you have the Politburo, the Central Committee. But from then on, it goes all the way down, all the way down into your very neighborhood, if you live in a city or a village, if you live in the rural areas. More interestingly, something that's not widely known is that private entrepreneurs, I'm sure you know this first part. Private entrepreneurs have been allowed at the party since the 90s. That was one of the things that uh, John Zinman in his three represents. That was one of the major things that um, he advocated for and, and uh, eventually got changed. Um, but who knows about the second part after the comma? Did anybody know that? No, right? So even in private enterprises, especially large ones, even foreign-owned enterprises in China, over 90% have party cells operating within them. So the party reaches down into every aspect of Chinese society. Doesn't necessarily mean they control what you do, but they do know what's going on. And they have to know what's going on, you know, in order to protect the system, right? All right, also, this is from Quora written by a, a party member, a young party member. Why does China have to uphold the leadership of the CPC? Well, story, there are a couple of stories. First story. So everybody knows 2008, the Wintron earthquake, right? Devastating earthquake, 8.0 on the Richter scale, uh, hit uh, mainly Sichuan province, which sits on a fault line. 
So in 2008, <coughs> catastrophic 8.0 earthquake hit my hometown. Thousands died. Survivors rushed outside and caused a traffic jam. You may have seen a similar scenario from disaster movies. Well, that's what it looked like then. When everybody was trapped, a man in his 40s knocked on all the car's windows, one by one, asking if there were any CPC members willing to help restore the flow of traffic. About one and a half dozen CPC members organized themselves, including me. We played the role of temporary traffic police until the real police came to take control. Then all of us merged back into the crowd. Nothing special. Just when people needed help, I know it was my time to stand out. Right? This is, this is integrity, right? I mean, in the West, you're hearing, they like to play up the stories of corruption, which by the way, it's a lot better now, of, you know, political intrigue at the top levels. But for like an average citizen, you know, on the grassroots, this is what the party means for them, all right? This is what, uh, what is expected of a party member. I mean, there are lots of other stories on, on Quora where they're like, people are like, oh, what does it mean to be a party member? Well, you gotta pay dues, you gotta go through this arduous process. I don't really see any major benefits, but definitely every time like a natural disaster happens, you gotta be on the front lines, right? You're the first to go, you know? You get voluntold, you're the first to go, because that's your responsibility as a party member. So here's the second story. He said, one day later I was watching TV and saw a reporter with her cameraman taking a military helicopter into a remote mountain region to send food and water to earthquake survivors because all the roads and phone lines had been destroyed. By a stroke of sheer luck, the helicopter found a small village in a valley, but the pilot could not find a flat place to land. From the live car uh, camera, I saw a girl rush up to the chopper. By girl, it doesn't mean actually like a mine. You have to be an adult to be a party member, but you know, like Asian people, someone in their early 20s or mid 20s can easily be confused for a teenager, even by other Asian. Um, I saw a girl rush up to the chopper holding a red notebook in her hand. When she came closer, she held up her red notebook, which was in fact her party membership card, and shouted to the reporter with tears in her eyes that she is a CPC member. She said the village she was buried under a pile of rubble, so she was in charge of the village now. She thanked the PLA, said that the villagers just needed some water, and that the PLA should send the food to places that really needed it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's thinking of not yourself, right? It's, it's thinking of others before yourself. I mean, that's sort of, that's the core tenet of communism, socialism, right? We're taught here <laughs> in the US, in a capitalist society, greed is good, right? Like Smith, the invisible hand, like the greed that just cancels each other out. No, no, it just, it just makes things worse. Like everybody's looking out for themselves, dog eat dog. Like is that really the type of society you want to live in? Or you want to live in a society where people take care of each other, right? Where people step up, very young people, very young people step up and, and take responsibility because it's, it's their time. They know that's what they have to do. Yeah, as a party member, if no one else is there to do that job, it's your responsibility to do that job. So that's why core tenet, right? One of the four principles, cardinal principles, upholding leadership of the CPC. Uh, all right, the last one, upholding Mao Zedong thought and Marxism-Leninism. What does that mean in practical terms? There's not gonna be a de-Stalinization event in China. There's, no, there's not going to be a secret speech, right? As a matter of fact, the fall of the Soviet Union, by the way, studied in and out by the Communist Party of China. They have like an army of, of experts of, of all kinds, party theorists, you know, uh, Marxist theorists, uh, sociologists, historians, whatever. They, they studied this problem inside and out because they're like, we can't let this happen to us, right? We're like the last bastion of socialism in the world. We can't let this happen to us. And what they found was, okay, everybody knows about Glasnost and Perestroika and the, the, the absolutely devastating effects it had on the Soviet Union. But what they found was the root cause, right, of the Soviet Union's downfall was de-Stalinization. Khrushchev, denouncing Stalin, right? And by the way, we saw earlier how socialism with Chinese characteristics is constantly changing, constantly adapting, right? I, th I think in the Soviet Union at least, 
when Stalin died, that's when the adaptations, right? That, that's when it kind of stopped. There's what com you have Marxism, you have Leninism, you have Stalinism. What comes after Stalinism? There's nothing that comes after Stalinism, right? There is no more theoretical contribution, in a way, by the Soviet Communist Party to Marxist theory. Because you, once you strip away Stalinism, I mean, what do you have? Right? And that's, that's what the Communist Party of China arrived at. That's, that, they believe, was the starting point of when things started to go wrong in the Soviet Union. Was de-Stalinization, the secret speech, Khrushchev denouncing Stalin. Of course, Mao had a huge problem with that. That's what ultimately caused the Sino-Soviet split. But even to this day, even to this day, right? The party, the Chinese party believes that was what caused everything to go wrong in the Soviet Union. There's not gonna be a transition to a liberal democratic state. Not on the party's watch, all right? Because that means what a reversion to a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And I know, and I remember distinctly back in the 90s, John Zeman, President John Zeman at that time, he said, well, the ultimate goal of China is to become a democracy, right? Well, first of all, democracy is a core socialist value. It's another one of those terms that's up to interpretation, right? So what is democracy to the Chinese is different than what democracy means to Western liberal society. But second of all, I think he also said that as sort of like a subterfuge, right? To confuse the West, to sort of buy time for China to become rich and powerful. He said, yeah, basically, I mean, he's trying to sell the idea, hey, look, listen, all right, just lay off, all right, don't sanction us or anything because, hey, by the time we get rich, by when we get to like, you know, eight to $10,000 per capita GDP, we're gonna be a democracy just like you, right? Of course, China's gotten to that point. It is not a liberal democracy like us. I think the game's kind of up. And then, you know, I think everybody in China knew that this trade war, it was gonna happen sooner or later, right? If it didn't happen under Trump, it would've happened under someone else. Just, the US is not going to allow another power to usurp its position as the number one global economic power in the world. It wasn't even willing to let that happen within the capitalist camp. If you remember what happened to Japan in the 80s, right? Everything, the Plaza Accords, voluntary export restraints, everything the U.S. did to beat down Japan, which is a firm American ally and a firm member of the capitalist camp. The U.S. wasn't even willing to tolerate a rising challenger within its own camp much less from an opposing camp, right? So I think the Chinese knew that it was coming. It was coming sooner or later. Um, but, you know, John Zeman, he said that. I think it was, it was meant to, to buy more time, right? Because trade war with China now, I mean, China's like, okay, whatever. Like, bring it. Like, I think, I think, we, can, I think we can take this, you know? We'll see, who, we'll see who outlasts the other. But imagine trade war with China 20 years ago, right? would have strangled socialism with Chinese characteristics in the crib. It would have been devastating. So the Chinese leaders then said, okay, okay, you know, give us some time, we'll be just like you. But of course, did not become just like you. Um, no separation of the party and the state military. The state and the military. Uh, that's, another, that's another thing that, uh, that was a lesson learned from the Soviet Union, right? It, uh, the nationalization of the Soviet armed forces left the, power, the party completely uh, powerless during the time of crisis. To this day, actually, the People's Libera Liberation Army does not belong to the People's Republic of China. It belongs to the Communist Party of China. It is technically the armed wing of the Communist Party of China. And it's gonna stay that way, at least, you know, at least while Xi Jinping's around, and probably for a long time after that, too. And the Communist Party of China will always be the political vanguard that guides Chinese society to advance from the primary state of socialism, which we're still in, to a fully socialist society, to eventually a communist society. That is the goal, that has always been the goal, is to achieve full communism in China. 
It's, it's like I said, the goal is not to become like the capitalist West. That's going backwards. It's going backwards in history. All right? The vanguard part is supposed to lead China, lead humanity forward into history. There's a political poster with Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. Unbroken tradition <laughs> of, of communist thought. Okay, part three, the most exciting part, right? What has socialism with Chinese characteristics been able to achieve? Oh no. Hold on a second. I've got some issues over here. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, okay, good, 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 okay. All right, so uh, the, my calculations, they, they, they're kind of cut off in there, well, okay, got it, got it, thank you. Back. So, that's China and blue. All the green countries have per capita GDP higher than China. All the red countries have per keep per capita GDP uh, that's lower than China. As you can see, China is now more prosperous than most of the third world. <coughs> really, only the industrialized West and some of the Gulf states, right, is still richer than China on a per capita level. Huge. So these numbers we saw back in 1978, what are they like now? 1978 per capita GDP, $156. This year, estimated to be over 10,000, a 65 time increase. Automobiles, 0 0.009 per thousand persons, and that was in Beijing, the capital. What is it now? 242.9 per thousand. And that's across the entire country. 1.05 television sets per thousand persons. Now there are actually more television sets than there are people in China. All right? There are 1,068 television sets per thousand persons. 2.18 telephones back in, back in 1978. 964 mobile phones. Now, I mean, nobody uses landlines anymore, right? 964. I think this number comes out to be like, the, the amount increases like 26,000 or something crazy like that. But you can see, right? These numbers are astounding. Just 40 years, China went from one of the poorest countries in the world to one where everybody has the niceties of modern society in just 40 years in this vast country a fifth of humanity right all right well let's take a look at uh oh, what happened again um oh so uh, it's normally called bricks but i took china house so and now it's bris <laughs> but okay so per capita gdp right 1978, all right, where are you now? China, $156. Brazil, Brazil was pretty well off back then, right? Uh, $1,700, 11.2 times that of China. India, $206. India, on a per capita basis, was richer than China in 1978. Soviet Union, 4430. South Africa, about the same level as Brazil, 1722. All right, what about today? Today in 2018, China is right below 10,000, right? That was last year. This year it's going to be above 10,000. Brazil, only 89.21. It's less than China now. India, way less. Only 20% that of China. South Africa and Russia got cut off, but you can see, right? Like this is this is South Africa right here. A little over a little over 6,000 less than China. And Russia is this gold line right here. China is not that far off. Not that far off. 
from Russia. Russia, I think, is around 11,000. So China was the poorest country out of, the, out of BRICS back in 1978. Now it is richer on a per capita level. It's richer than all but one, Russia. Right? And Russia has vast mineral resources, vast wealth. Uh, that you know that can be dug out of the ground. So, you know, it's impressive, very impressive, right? Well, let's take a look at China versus post-socialist states. Well, I started in 1990 because that's when you know stuff hit the fan <laughs> for the socialist for the socialist world, right? China at that time was oh you know it was actually twice as rich as it was back in 1978, but still only 318. Right, low three digits GDP. Bosnia in 1994, in the midst of a civil war, right? Still <laughs> richer than China. Okay, Poland, <coughs> Romania, Ukraine, right? As we saw with Brazil, South Africa, all around you know, like the fifteen hundred dollar range. So, relatively not rich, but industrialized, right? Slovenia, for some reason, like Slovenia was, is very prosperous. Like even back then, I, I and I looked this up. Apparently, they have a very small population, but it was like heavily industrialized in the Federal Socialist Republic of, of Yugoslavia. So they had like all these industries and they had all this uh, human capital and actually a very small percentage of population. So when it split off, it, it had it had a much better uh, time than the other former Yugoslav republics. But as you can see here, right, in 2018, this is Ukraine down here. Ukraine's only like $3,000. And it's in terrible shape after, after that revolution in 2014, right? Yeah. Mistake there, listening to the CIA. Um, uh, let's see, Bosnia, about $5,000, a little less than $6,000, all right? I think this is Romania, this is Poland. Uh, between you know the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range, so not that much higher than China, right? But back then they were five times, they were all about five times richer than China. Now it's like maybe one point two, one point three times, and then even Slovenia is only about two point six or two point eight times richer than China, right? And you can see all these countries. What happened between two thousand eight, two thousand nine? All took a dip from the Great Recession, right? All these countries. China, did it take a dip during that time? Nope, still kept on growing 9%. That's what happens. All right, so here's what the country looked like back then. And this isn't even, this isn't even 1978, this is 1990. And this isn't 2019, this is 2010, this is just 20 years. Shanghai, right? That entire skyline was built in just 20 years. Straight out of Blade Runner. All farmland back then, and some, you know, low-rise buildings. Beijing, 1978. See? Do you see any cars on the street? You see some bikes, you see a couple of buses. Do you see any cars? Right? Even in the capital, very few passenger cars. The same view 40 years later. That's what it looks like now. Same view. New roads. Got all these cars, right? Driving at pretty high speeds because they're all blurred out. All right, you get brand new, glassy, you know, glass towers, nice trees. Shenzhen farmland, fishing village, 1978. China Silicon Valley now. All right, it's what 40 years of socialism with Chinese characteristics has done for the country. More dynamic than Hong Kong now. All right? Hong Kong's got some serious issues, mostly because of capitalism. And again, media tries to frame it as a problem of socialism. No. It's, I mean, capital, it, it's Hong, Kong's like, Hong Kong's like a capitalist wet dream. All right? Zero state tax, very low income tax, like 17% average income tax. Uh, few very wealthy families, tycoons, own pretty much all the land, right? Uh, but then what happens? 
Home ownership rates in China, mainland China, over 90%. Hong Kong, only 50%. People can't, and, and, and you know, and these places they live in, I won't even call them homes, tiny. It's inhumane. Even the UN said this is a human, gross human rights violation, right? So how has this persisted in Hong Kong? It's because of capitalism. It's one of the only two places in China that practices capitalism, right? And Macau is the other one uh, in, the, in, in the PRC, I should say. Macau is the other one, but Macau actually was de facto taken over by Red Guards in the 60s. So they actually, they, they despite being politically separate, legally separate, uh, they pretty much march in step with Beijing. But Hong Kong, you know, before the British handed that, territory over they just I mean they they like lay they lay landmines everywhere you know and they're blowing up one by one now but so capital is meant landmines right like how do, what do you expect when people when half the people can't more than half the people can can't afford to buy homes ever ever right think about that think about that <clears throat> That's what a bus stop looked like in 1978. Look at that really, really old looking bus, right? And look at the roads, look at the buildings, look at the people. A bus stop in Guangzhou now. Nice air conditioned buses, nice buildings, nice roads. A street stall in Kaifen, the ancient capital of Kaifen, 1978. I mean, this is, this is kind of what you would expect a third world country to look like, right? You go there, and people are setting up street stalls. Street stalls turn into modern boutiques now. Same city, 40 years later. Fashionable young woman doing some shopping, you know? Like what, what you would see on Fifth Avenue. Wedding photography, 1978. Like, my, my parents, they had a wedding photo just like this. All right, and you can see, the, it's not even a full gown, right? The woman's just wearing like a top because only like the top part, you only get the top part. She's wearing pants, you know, the bottom half, right? It's not even a full gown. But this is what, this is what a, a wedding, uh, wedding photo looked like back in 1978. This is what a wedding photograph looks like now. You know, I should have, next time you got to remind me, I, I had some of these taken. They were just outrageous. They're, they're outrageous, you know? But this is what they do now, you know? And they touch it up and they make it look all nice. And look at that, like you have, they have helpers to like throw the dress open so it looks super nice, right? And that's wedding photography now. Ice cream. Back then, 1978, it's literally just a wooden box maybe with ice cream and like ice to keep it cool inside. See what this little boy's doing? He's painting with the cell phone. Yeah, like there are a lot of places. I first discovered this a couple years ago, but now like I kind of expect this now. A lot of places you have to ask them first. You're like, hey, do you take cash? And 50% of the time they're like, no, sorry. Do you have Alipay, do you have WeChat Pay? I don't carry any cash anymore. I'm like, oh my. Yeah. Problem is you can, only, you can only set that up on your phone if you have a Chinese bank account. So if you visit there, it's kind of challenging. I hope the government does something. Make it easier for tourists, foreign tourists, to uh, travel and, and pay and stuff because uh, a lot of places don't take cash anymore. Bookstore, 1978, right? Right after the Cultural Revolution, you still see a lot of communist era, you know, Mao era posters with heavy communist themes, revolutionary themes. Bookstore, 1978. Bookstore now. <coughs> what a bookstore looks like now. Oh, you still have communist themes, right? It's, you see this book cover right here is Joe and Lai and his wife. So, and people reading, relaxing, gaining knowledge. Cars. This is a Shanghai brand car in 1978, probably literally one of the few thousands that were produced that year, you know? This guy's very happy. I don't know if it's actually his car or belonged to his work unit, but Hey, I remember I, when I was a kid back in the late 80s, 
I saw one of these cars. I was so excited. I had my parents take a picture of me like with my hand holding like on the hood because cars were so rare back then. To sit in the driver's seat, like even, I, I don't, you don't even have to drive it. Just to sit there would be like, man, this is pretty amazing. So this isn't actually in China. It was in Vancouver. When there were, you know, a couple, couple weeks ago, there were Hong Kong, pro-Hong Kong protests, and then there were like Chinese counter-protests, and like a whole bunch of Chinese students or, you know, recent Chinese immigrants drove up in supercars draped in the Chinese flag, right? And in the foreground, you see like a black-clad Hong Kong protester going thumbs down. <laughs> right? But yeah, this guy's driving a Ferrari, this Chinese flag on the hood, another <laughs> giant Chinese flag flying out the window, right? That's, and you see these supercars, you see luxury cars all over the streets in China. When 40 years ago, literally no one owned cars. Very, even very few government uh, entities had cars available. Middle class household, 1978. Looks pretty uh, drab, but I know they're middle class, why? They have a TV. They got an electric fan. Those were huge items back in the 70s, man. If you could afford those, you were definitely solidly middle class, probably upper middle class. This is what a middle class family looks like now. All right? Now, how do I know they're only, only middle class, not super rich? It's because the furniture and the decor is kind of, you know, mismatch, right? Like, you it's not, you know, doesn't, everything doesn't fit perfectly together, but you can see <coughs> food on the table, lots of it, right? Chinese people love eating. But back in 1978, you probably eat like that once a year during Chinese New Year. Now you can eat like that every day. And you got, you know, speakers, air conditioning, flat screen TV, everything, right? 40 years of economic progress. Trains, 1978, that's what a train, what a Chinese train looked like 40 years ago. Like the train workers didn't look like a fun job, right? Pretty dirty, pretty, uh, pretty grimy work. High-speed rail today. It's Chinese trains today, all right? It's something that we don't even have over here. We're probably never gonna have. It's People's Liberation Army, 1978. Probably 1979, they're probably about to go off the battle against Vietnam in the Sino-Vietnam War in 1979, right? Like, they're like, these guys don't look very well equipped, you know, <laughs> right? They don't even have camouflage uniforms, just a steel helmet and like some guns. Looks not that different from the army that brought Mao to power some 40 years uh, earlier, or 30 years earlier. It's the PLA today, right? You know, sharp camouflage uniforms, a lot of heavy equipment in the background, helicopters, trucks, armored personnel carriers, tanks, right? This was the most advanced fighter jet in the Chinese Air Force in 1978. It's the J-7. It's a copy of the Soviet MiG-21. This is the most advanced fighter. By that time, the U.S. already had F-14s, uh, F-16s, F-15s, which is the mainstay of the U.S. Air Force today. <clears throat> this is the J-20, China's most advanced stealth fighter today. Completely domestically built and designed. Although some people say, you know, China stole the planes, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, this is the Navy, back in 1978. Type 51 destroyer, NATO code name, uh, Lu Da. Look, old school, like World War II era, anti-aircraft guns. You're gonna, you're gonna shoot a modern fighter jet or modern bomber out of the sky with that thing? Probably not, right? The U.S. already had guided missile destroyers and nuclear power aircraft carriers by this time. This is the newest Type 55. Destroyer. Look how much sleeker it is, right? Integrated mass. I, in case you guys don't know, I was a former U.S. naval officer, so this kind of stuff excites me. Yeah. <laughs> Integrated mast over here. 
These two panels are active phased array radars that can do track hundreds of targets, just like uh, the Arleigh Burke class destroyers in the U.S. Navy. Um, over a hundred, I think 112. You, do you see any missile launchers? No, you don't, because they're vertical. All right, there's there's like 60 of them over here, and then like another, you know, 40 of them back there. And you can doesn't like it's not like the old system where a specific type of launcher can launch a specific type of missile. It's multi-purpose. You can you can customize how many missiles, what type of missiles, anti-air, anti-ship, ground attack, anti-submarine. You can customize what goes into the vertical launch tubes, right? And the stealthy design. And China's technological achievements. In 1978, China led the world in just about nothing. Okay, today, China is a leader in the following fields of technology, renewable energy, electric vehicles, high-speed <coughs> mobile apps, drones, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, biotech, telecommunications, aerospace, shipbuilding, defense. Do people like people recognize these these logos? Yeah? What's it? You know you know what this is? Oh, Huawei, well, right? Yeah, of course. You know what that is? No. So this is the uh, this C R R C. They're the ones that make the high speed rail trains. And then this is like a traditional Chinese character. It looks like a traditional Chinese character for car or for, for chariot back in the day, right? And then on the inside you can see the character uh, for China or the middle middle kingdom. And then you can see the two C's too, right? That's pretty smart. It's pretty smart. TikTok. Do you know TikTok was Chinese? No, you didn't know that, right? And the reason why it has that symbol is it, it, it looks like a D, because in Chinese, uh, the app is actually called Douyin. Oh. It starts with a D. Yeah, it's about like, I go on YouTube and watch like Chinese TikTok videos. It's, oh my God, it's such a waste of time, but it's super, super hilarious. Um, this is uh, the, China, the China Lunar Exploration Program, CLEP. Uh, you see here two little footprints, right? That's the ultimate goal is to send human beings back to the moon. I firmly believe the next human beings to set foot on the moon are going to be Chinese. But this put together with this crescent, you know, the crescent moon, with these little two uh, footprints, it's the Chinese character for moon. So again, integrating Chinese, traditional Chinese culture China's cultural heritage with the modern socialist system, right? And it's, you know, a lot of these, um, the, the project, um, the, the, the project right now of sending the uh, unmanned spacecraft to the moon is called the Chang'e Project. Chang'e is the mythical goddess of the moon. All right? She has a pet rabbit called the Jade Rabbit. And that's the name that called Yu Tu right, in Chinese. That's the name they gave to the rover. <laughs> it's the Jade Rabbit, the Jade Rabbit rover, right? Again, combining traditional Chinese uh, mythology with modern Chinese social. You guys know what that is? DJI? They're the number one drone manufacturer in the world. You can go on Google right now. Like, yeah, I had to look up DJI <coughs> logo to find that logo, because if you just type in DJI, like, the only thing you're gonna see are a bunch of drones. Um, you guys know what BYD is? You don't really see them here, but they're huge in China. They're the largest electric car maker in the world, BYD. Much cheaper than Tesla. Much cheaper than Tesla. And Norinco, uh, they're China's biggest uh, defense manufacturer. So they produce mostly ground equipment. Uh, so small arms, artillery, uh, tanks, so they provide military equipment to the PLA and a lot of foreign militaries around the world. So what are the secrets to the success of socialism with Chinese characteristics? Number one on that list, I would put diligence, all right? Hard work from President Xi all the way down to the poorest subsistence farmer in the most remote regions of China. Everyone is working hard. I mean, 
Do I think President Xi is like the smartest man in China? Do I even think that he's the smartest man in the Communist Party? Probably not in terms of IQ. But I certainly believe he's one of the most hardworking individuals in the entire country. And that is the secret to his success and the success of the entire country. Everybody is working hard. And again, that's something that's completely counter to this narrative socialism that we have here in the West, right? Oh, socialism is just about handing out free stuff. It's about people being lazy, not doing work, you know? Like everybody, everybody's kind of leeching off of the, the couple of people who are doing actual work. Have you guys ever been to China, any of you? Just one day. Just one day? Mm -hmm. If you go out into the streets of China, any, any city, any place in China, you'll see people running around, bustling about, working, working, working every day. I mean, the, the startup culture in China, they, they, they say, it, they call it a, a 996. It's from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. That's what's expected of you if you work for a startup. The government actually came out and said those hours, working hours are illegal, mm. <laughs> according to Chinese labor laws, but uh, I think the government also knows that, you know, in order to, uh, in order to defeat capitalism in the long run, people got to work a lot harder, right? And of course, you know, China can only depend on itself. I mean, capitalism has, a, has been able to generate wealth in the West because of colonialism, imperialism, of stealing resources from native populations, from the populations of other countries, right? Countries like China, you know, during the century of humiliation. But did China do any of that uh, in order to get to where it is today? No, it's only through the hard work of the Chinese people that has been able to get to this point. Rationalism. To me, that means doing stuff that makes sense. Doing stuff that's not crazy, all right? Not allowing things like anti-vaxxers to get any, you know, to get any airtime, all right? Or any of the other things or like equating creationism with evolution, right? All these things that, you know, don't make sense, the Chinese are just like, no. No, no, no. This, they're not on equal setting, right? I'm not going to give you equal airtime to, to voice your crazy ideas versus an idea that is proven to be true, all right? Factually true. Pragmatism. That's, uh, you know, like I said, that's just doing stuff that works. That's not putting labels on things, right? One of the, one of the major things is oh, we're going we're gonna to stop after the Cultural Revolution, and we're, we're not gonna be like putting labels on things like this is capitalism, this is socialism. That's not important anymore, right? Deng Xiaoping famously said, I don't care if a cat is white or black, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat, right? It means I don't care if you use communist methods, socialist methods, or capitalist methods. At the end of the day, you know, if you grow the productive forces, the number one goal of socialism with Chinese characteristics, then it's something that we can adopt. It's something that works, right? So pragmatism. Adaptability, kind of touched upon that earlier, is every leader, every era, there are new challenges that are different than the previous challenge, right? And you have to adapt in order to be successful. In 1970, the problems that China had in 1978, very different than the problems China have today, right? So you have to be adaptable. The party has to be adaptable. The leaders have to be adaptable to these changing circumstances in order to keep up with the times and address the problems of that particular era, right? Don't want to become stagnant. Don't want to keep doing the same thing just because that was the <coughs> way it was done before. Scientific experimentation. There are, this is not just for like science, the hard sciences. This is, I'm talking about social science. I'm talking about testing out policies in a scientific manner, right? Like it would be crazy for the Chinese, to, to the, for the Chinese mind, for the Chinese political system to roll out like a national tax reform without having ever tried it on a smaller level. That, to them, that's insane. Like you can do, if things don't go well, you can do a lot of damage to your country, 
because there are always unforeseen circumstances, right? Something that might work in theory may not actually work in fact. That's why you gotta try things out first, you know? In a city, perhaps, or a village, perhaps. And then if it works, and you try different, different experiments, and you, know, you kinda compare them against one another, and you kinda figure out which ones worked, which ones did, right? Shenzhen worked, worked spectacularly. So those policies got implemented nationwide eventually. But there were a lot of experiments that didn't work. What happened? Just, you know, you got good data, but you don't implement those policies, right? You try things out, then you move them progressively upward to the national level. You can't just roll out a national policy when it hasn't been tried at a local level and proven to work. Humility. Right? Chinese are never, you go talk to a Chinese person from the mainland and you ask them, do you think China is the best country in the world? None of them will say yes. None of them will say yes. They might say, well, you know, China is the most populous country in the world, right? China may have the largest GDP in the world now. Uh, China is the world's oldest existing civilization, right? I mean, these are all facts, right? Chinese people like facts, Chinese people don't like opinions. But, you know, is China the best country? I mean, how do you define best? Right? How do you define that? How do you quantify that? And, of course, Chinese are like, yeah, I don't, I don't really like to brag, right? Humility, one of the, you know, traits of, of Taoism. It's very ingrained in Chinese society, Chinese culture. Chinese people don't like to brag. So, when you ask them, you know, is China the best country in the world? They're like, no. No, we still got a lot of problems, right? Still got, despite all our achievements, we still got a lot. Problems that we have to solve, problems that we have to face. I mean, contrast that with what you're taught in America, right? I mean, you ask the average American, is America the best country in the world? Yes. Okay, what does that even mean? Like, what are we best at these days, right? You know, best at what? Like school shootings? <laughs> best at like incarcerating more people than literally any other country in the world? Right, including China, which has a population four times ours, best at invading other countries. I mean, what, seriously, like, what does that even mean, right? Just, oh, but with best, okay, yeah, okay, Roger that, whatever. Um, one I left out here was uh, meritocracy. Again, ingrained within Chinese society. All right, China did not have the same type of feudalism that Western countries had. Very early on in its history, the emperor saw feudal lords as uh, a threat to his power, so he basically neutered them of any political power and replaced them with, with the Confucian bureaucracy, exactly. A learned class of gentlemen who rose through the ranks through their merit as opposed to their birth. And that is something that is still very ingrained in Chinese society today, right? How do you rise to the ranks of the Communist Party? Like, first of all, it's very difficult even to join, but how do you rise to the ranks, right? How do you, how do you go from Xi Jinping, right? From when he started out in his 20s as like a lowly village party secretary all the way to the president? How does that happen? There are key performance indicators, KPI, right? Something that the business world is very, uh, um, familiar with, but you're graded on how well you do based on key performance indicators for your region, right? How quickly did you grow the economy? How much did you grow the economy? How many people did you save from poverty, right? How many, how many people did you provide, you know, how many hospitals got upgraded? How many more people got basic medical treatment? All these things. How many college graduates did your did your locale produce? Right. All these different things come together, and then you're promoted based on how well you do. I mean, it's like over here we have a president who's never held public office in a day in his life before being the president. Like that again would be crazy to the Chinese. Like, would you would a Fortune 500 company appoint as the CEO somebody who's never worked? in that company, much less 
in that industry? Absolutely not. So, so why do you think it's a good idea to have someone who's never been in public service be the president? That's just crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy to the Chinese, right? You want to be the president? Fine. You got to work your butt off for 40 years. <laughs> you know, from the bottom all the way to the top. Finally, learning from others. Uh, and this is, you know, learning the good stuff and also learning the mistakes, right? The good stuff, the, the advanced production methods, the advanced ways to generate wealth from the most advanced capitalist countries in the world, all the technology, all the know-how, learn that, right? Just because it came from a capitalist country doesn't mean it's bad. It's good if put in the right hands, good with the right intentions, right? And just because a fellow communist country does something doesn't mean it's necessarily good. It could be bad, it could be very bad, right? It could be so bad that it destroys the entire socialist project, like what happened in the Soviet Union, right? As I said, um, I brought this up earlier, but this is what President Xi Jinping said in 2013, we must stand firm on the party's leadership over the military. Why must we stand firm on the party's leadership over the military? Because that's the lesson from the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the Soviet <coughs> Union, where the military was depoliticized, separated from the party and nationalized. The party was disarmed. When the country came to crisis point, the big party was gone just like that. Proportionally, the Soviet Communist Party had more members than we, the Communist Party of China, do. But nobody was man enough to stand up and resist, right? You don't just learn the good lessons, you also learn the mistakes from others. So you hopefully don't make these same mistakes yourself, right? So, um, about a year ago, I uh, watched this speech on YouTube by a military, Chinese military historian, uh, also a major general in the PLA, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jing Yinan. And he gave a speech in Hong Kong it's called uh, uh, From the Century of Humiliation to National Rejuvenation, you know, how basically, how, how far China has come in the modern era. Opium War to today, and uh, uh, I actually I, I transcribed the, the I transcribed the uh, the speech and I translated in English. So if you're interested, just let me know. I can send it's on it's on my you know Google Drive. I'll send you the link. You can read it. Um, one of the things that he said that was very profound is Marxism changed China, right? So last year was the 200th anniversary of Marx's birth. There's celebrations in China, as you can see the entire Politburo and members of the Central Committee are standing under a giant portrait of Karl Marx, right? His memory, his philosophy, his ideas very much still revered, respected in China. Because why? You know? Because China, uh, Marxism changed China. Without Marxism, there would be no Chinese miracle. Without Marxism, China would not have been able to stand up on its two feet again, to stand up to the capitalist, imperialist powers of the world, right? Marxism allowed China, do, allowed China to do that. China had, ever, you know, ever since the first opium war, China has had different revolutionaries who tried to save the country, who tried to make things better, who tried to make China strong again. But none of them succeeded until the Communist Party came around, until Marxism came around. So, of course, Chinese people uh, have huge, huge respect, you know, of Karl Marx, this German dude from the 19th century, right? Who's not even Chinese, but hey, doesn't matter. It was his ideas that saved China. But at the same time, uh, General Jin, he also said, China changed Marxism, right? At the same time, this is Karl Marx's uh, birthplace, the town of Trier in Western Germany. This statue was a gift from the People's Republic of China to the town of Trier, right? It was very controversial at the time, whether or not the town would accept it, but they ultimately did. Um, and if you think about it, right? Without China, real existing socialism probably would not exist today, right? China, if, like I said, Tiananmen Square, if those protesters had gotten their way, I mean, I don't think how 
If China had gone the way the Soviet Union, I don't think how North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, right, those few remaining socialist countries left, I, I don't think they would have, I don't think they could have held out with both communist giants uh, ending up in the dustbin of history, right? But China survived. China survived. Uh, and, and not only that, its contribution to Marxism is that the form of socialism is a practice of socialism with Chinese characteristics is demonstrating to the world that a Marxist-Leninist state can generate wealth faster and on a grander scale than any capitalist nation in the history of human civilization, right? That's China's contribution to Marxism. I had kind of an epiphany when I was in Shenzhen a couple years ago, right? I was waiting for a friend, I was, I was waiting to meet up with a friend, I looked around, all these brand new skyscrapers are all around me that are populated by all these new tech startups, right? And I suddenly I had this thought in my mind. I'm like, this is, this is Marxism done right. This is, this, is, this is Marxism that works and works spectacularly well, you know? And this is, this is the Marxism that's going to get us eventually to ultimate communism, right? And that's the goal. And this is just the first stage. Right? Still in the primary stage of socialism. Socialism with Chinese characteristics. The ultimate goal is to achieve communism, real existing communism, here on Earth. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. You guys have any questions for me? Anyone? I should say socialism with Chinese characteristics. You basically gave two separate tendencies that might characterize it as Chinese. Mm -hmm. One was that it relies on market reforms, mm -hmm. and the other is that it relies on Chinese cultural tendencies such as Confucianism, Taoism. Mm -hmm. Now, what makes Chi makes socialism with Chinese characteristics Chinese if you rely only on the market forces? Well, I would say that it isn't. Is it, yeah? I would say that it isn't. Okay. Yeah, it's it's that last element, right? of adapting, not just, uh, not just incorporating mar uh, market forces, but adapting socialism to work within a specific culture, within a specific civilization. Now that's, Caleb often says, socialism with American characteristics, right? Uh, America, the United States, has a very different culture, cultural underpinnings than China. So if we're to find a socialism that works here or socialism that works in any other country, it's gonna be different, it's gonna look different than what it looks like in China. You have to find how to adapt socialism because it's, like I said, it's a, it's a socialism is a living ideology, a living theory of living philosophy, right? It, you, have to, you have to adapt the theory to the actual circumstances in which it is practiced. So without that second part, without incorporating traditional Chinese thought, um, without incorporating Chinese cultural uh, underpinnings and tendencies, then no, I don't think it would be socialism with Chinese characteristics. So that brings me to my second part. <coughs> uh, socialism, in my uh, estimation, is perhaps the first stage. Mm -hmm. And you indicated that what makes specifically socialism with Chinese characteristics is the fact that there's certain cultural tendencies attached to mm -hmm. that socialism and not necessarily the market forces. So if we develop the productive forces <coughs> to the point right where 
now they're achieving a new level. Mm -hmm. What I found, uh, according to like the theses that were set forth by European Newton, is that there's another stage, and that next stage is intercommunalism. So, when I'm saying that it's that next stage, and I don't believe he applied it like that, I, I was looking to see where he was applying it. I believe that he misapplied it to communalism, okay. and I believe that may be the second phase because of what you just pointed out. And I guess it substantiates the thesis that socialism with Chinese characters or any type of national characteristics is relative to the nation state. Mm -hmm. Right. Once socialism achieves its historic goal, the nation state ceases to exist. Correct. And what happens is we develop a communal order. Mm -hmm. Now that communal order, which you described in your uh, in your presentation, that communal order could be characterized by reactionary tendencies as well as revolutionary tendencies. And that's going to ultimately split society into a revolutionary form of communalism or intercommunalism right. or and a reactionary form of intercommunalism. So the next stage of, of going past socialist development would have to be this form of revolutionary intercommunalism, which is, I see it in the theory of Huey, right, can only bring us into communism. That is that socialism is not the final stage. No. So I'm just applying your thesis of socialism with Chinese characteristics as being socialism with national characteristics for as long as there are the nations. Right. So would you basically conclude, right, that the next stage is a different stage and it won't go directly into communism, that there has to be some transformation into a communal order? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to predict, right? what will happen in, uh, in the future and how specifically it'll happen. And I guess that's sort of what is, an, is another sort of uh, core idea of socialism with Chinese characteristics is, you know, Dan Xiaoping also said, we're gonna cross the river by feeling out the stones. We don't know exactly how to get to the other side. We don't know what it'll look like. We have a general idea of what communism ultimately is. But we don't know what the intermediate stages um, between here and there, what exactly it'll look like, right? The only thing we can do is try to cross to that other side, try to get there. And we have some you know, basic, uh, basic principles that we're going to apply, but outside of these basic principles, we're gonna try whatever works in order to get there. Right? Is there another stage in between you know, a national, you know, socialism with national characteristics and communism? I can't say. Right. I was just wondering because that would bring me to my third point: the Great Belt and Road Mm-hmm. All right. Now, I've, I had this argument only just last night with some. I don't know if they're Maoists. I, I think they're pseudo Maoists. <laughs> no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I believe so because they're attempting to apply Mao in a way that 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 doesn't apply to historical development. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the importance of the Great Belt and Road Initiative, in my in my understanding is that it internationalizes socialism. In a way, yes. And I believe that should be, I, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I can't say, but I believe it is the goal of the Belt and Road yeah. Program. Now, <clears throat> this Belt and Road, I believe it's important in terms of struggling towards socialism ultimately and developing socialism because socialism cannot be obtained without world revolution. Because right. socialism is, right. is an international formation. Right. And it once it once it, it's obtained internationally, then this is when the stage in which 
communes will develop, but we can't develop moons and we can't end nations. This is why we have this Chinese with socialist characteristics. Now, the Great Belt and Road, my concern is how it can be used, right, to actually leap, leap forward revolutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's doing excellent work in, 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 in Africa with developed mm -hmm. nations that are established. But what about, I don't know if you know if it's implied, but what about with revolutionary movements? Mm -hmm. Can the Great Belt and Road be applied to, like, for instance, uh, the Republic of New Africa, which is uh, basically at this stage a non-existent colonial nation in the United States, mm -hmm. where, the where, where the colonial population is seeking independence from the United States along those same contradictions. Now, would it be possible for, like, for this Belt and Road to be applied to a non-state? You know, that's, that's a great question. I don't know if I have a concrete answer for that, right? Um, I think right now, uh, the PRC and the CPC's policy is one of non-interference in the internal affairs of, of foreign countries. So what happens within a country's borders, it's, it's up to them, right? But things change. Things weren't always like that. Certainly it wasn't like that under the Mao days. And it could be different once again, right? <clears throat> Especially as we progress through uh, to a new historic stage. If really we are talking about tearing down national borders, then that, you know, that's, um, then it really hits up in the air. You don't know. Um, I can only say what is the case right now, which is, uh, we're still in an era of nation states, although I do believe that the nation state, the concept, is uh, becoming weaker and weaker as time goes on, as globalization takes effect, right? Um, so, I don't know. Who, who, I can't say for sure. I can't say for sure what's going to happen, um, whether China would extend the Belt and Road um, to individual communities within a country. Um, certainly possible, right? It's certainly possible. But I think, you know, at this stage, it would be pretty difficult to do that, even if China wanted to, um, without buy-in from the national government, right? If, if, if say, China wanted to uh, build infrastructure programs, predominantly uh, African American or Native American or Hispanic, Hispanic American communities, I mean, do you think the U.S. government would allow that to happen? Right, probably not. <laughs> you know, even if China wanted to, so that's why it needs buy-in right now. At least in this stage, um, it needs the consent, the buy-in from national governments. Because once you delve within the nation state, if you don't get the buy-in, you don't get the consent from the national government, it's really difficult. At least the way nation states are set up right now um, to to do that, right? And of course, you know, China wants to differentiate itself from the U.S. China wants to show the world, hey, look, we respect national sovereignty, right? And it means maybe we have to allow some injustices to happen within a nation's borders, but we're not going to let that override the, uh, the great principle, the overriding principle of respecting national sovereignty, respecting a nation's borders, right? Not using uh, human rights abuses or whatever to go in there and mess things up even more, right? By military invasion or economic sanction or something else. You know, China's showing the world, hey, there's another way to do this. There's another way. Um, yeah, I do believe ultimately um, the Belt and Road is about propagating socialism. Um, I, that, that's not trumpeted by China because the West is conditioned to think negatively of that word, socialism, communism, Marxism. But if you are to, if, if, you know, the entire presentation is about releasing growing productive forces, right? You know, and, and, and if that's socialism, then absolutely. I think it absolutely is about exporting socialism because the Belt and Road is about releasing and building productive forces all across the world, especially 
in developing countries in the third world. So, you know, it's it's a complicated situation out there, right? Um, and certainly, I think you know, one thing, another another aspect of Chinese socialism is very adaptable. It's always changing. So who knows what might, you know, what the policies might look like 10, 15, 20 years down the road, right? I, I want to just react to some of what was said. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out um, is that, you know, presentations like this are very important because if you read the New York Times, they have made it their mission to get all the young people in the USA that are interested in Marxism now to not support China, almost explicitly, like to the point of like, you know, some young Marxist will be arrested in China and they'll make a headline, you know, young Marxist arrested in China, as if like young person who doesn't believe in capitalism, young person who believes in capitalism doesn't get arrested in the United States like every day, you know, I mean, um, and you know, they'll do a hit piece on China's healthcare system because they know that Bernie Sanders supporters really care about healthcare, so they do this, you know, slanderous hit piece and they're, they're really trying their hardest to get young people that are interested in Marxism in the United States to not look into China and not look into socialism. Um, and it's almost like they're preempting it because they know if if we start to learn from China's experience, that could make socialism in the United States much more powerful. I think, um, you know, you talk about the People's Democratic Dictatorship, um, and it's interesting because that you know Stalin. It actually comes from Stalin. When when the countries of Eastern Europe were being liberated from Nazi Germany, right, right. they brought together all the anti-Nazi and anti-fascist forces and created. They, they didn't call them socialist governments, but they called them People's Democratic governments. And eventually, by the 60s and 70s, they were moving towards socialism. But at first, they said, well, they're going to have a market economy, but it's going to be a people's democratic government that would just be a unity of anti-fascist forces. Um, I think that's interesting, and in that while that was happening in Eastern Europe, William Z. Foster, a leader of the US Communist Party, he started referring to these people's democracies. He called them anti-monopoly governments, right? And he started arguing that the, the Communist Party of the United States would fight for an anti-monopoly government. It would be a government that would represent maybe small business owners, maybe small farmers, maybe factory workers, but it would be against the big monopolies. And that was kind of his US version of Stalin's theory of a people's democracy. I thought that was interesting. Um, and I, I really think it's great how you put in the cultural context about Confucianism and Taoism. Um, and that then forces me to raise the question that I continue to raise. And I get a lot of flack for raising, which is what aspects of US culture could those who believe in socialism here cling on to in order to build socialism. And I see so many people in the USA who believe in socialism, just they just want to declare independence from US culture. They just want to hate US culture. And, yeah, and culture, these things are deeply ingrained in people, like entrepreneurialism and working hard to get ahead. This is really ingrained in the American people. So why, why would we as socialists try to completely erode you know, American culture? Why not just find aspects of US culture that we can find to adjust and adapt for socialism? Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think that's really important. I wanted to mention, similar to what he said, um, you know, in 1963, there was that historical civil rights march, the March on Washington by Martin Luther King Jr. And it's interesting, because there were, there were three big communist groups in the USA at the time. The biggest one was the Communist Party USA. And because they were the official Soviet-aligned Communist Party, the, the civil rights organizers asked them to not participate in that march. And they were there, they just, in their own name, they didn't participate. They didn't hand out any of their literature. They were there, but they were not publicly there because that would have been a PR disaster for Martin Luther King. Um, but then the Trotskyite Party, the Socialist Workers Party, their participation, they were there, um, and they handed out their newspaper, The Militant, and they were calling on the civil rights movement to form a new party that would be a civil rights or a freedom democratic party that would not be part of the Democratic Party. And that was kind of a strategically dumb thing to do because at the time, the African Americans of the South were demanding the right to join the Democrats. So telling them they should form a different party was almost like disregarding what they were asking for. But there was another party that their youth group was Youth Against War and Fascism. And what they did at that historic march is they printed out a speech by Mao Zedong. Um, and it was Mao's speech in support of Martin Luther King Jr. A lot of people don't know that, that Martin Luther King was supported by Mao. Um, and they printed out this speech with the headline, One Quarter of Humanity is on Your Side. And hundreds of thousands of copies of Mao's statement were distributed at, at the Martin Luther King March on Washington, where he gave the famous I Have a Dream speech, you know, with the headline, One Quarter of Humanity is on Your Side, with that speech by Mao. I think that's really amazing, you know. You can also talk about the fact that when Robert F. Williams formed the, uh, the armed groups to fight the KKK in Monroe, North Carolina, of course he had to flee the United States. Where did he go? He went to China. He yeah. lived in China for many years. There's a picture of Mao and Robert F. Williams together, and I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, and that kind of leads me to what I wanted to ask you. Um, 
because he alluded to it as well. I wanted you to talk about Mao versus Maoists because I think there's a big difference, right? Mao I see as a brilliant Marxist, you know, a brilliant statesman, a brilliant economist, a brilliant political organizer, and I see Maoists as people who kind of fetishize the fact that he had a gun and, and fetishize the fact that he engaged in people's war and don't, you know, they, they overlook the brilliance of this man who's probably going to go down in history. He's going to be on the level of like a Julius Caesar, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, he's going to be remembered as one of the most pivotal people in the history. I mean, what he started in China, taking China from the center of humiliation to where it is now, that's like one of the biggest turnarounds in the history of all civilization. I mean, Mao is going to be remembered thousands and thousands of years from now, but these Maoists who kind of fetishize the violence and like to wave the little red book around, they're not doing him justice. And the cultural revolution and, and the politics that come out of that, the Gang of Four era, I feel like is largely a distortion of, of what Mao was really about. And I was hoping you could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, um, Mao, the reason why he was so, so successful is because he understood China better than anybody else. And he understood how to apply Marxism to China better than anybody else. That was the key to his success. Um, and so what he did was to adapt Marxism, right? To change it, to refine it, to fit the particular circumstances of China. That was his key contribution. And really, you know, like I pointed out in, in, my, in the, the beginning of my presentation, um, it's really not that big of a leap then to move from Maoism to what is today socialism with Chinese characteristics. Because in a way, Maoism is socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? China at that time did not have the capability to carry out a traditional Marxist revolution. It had almost zero uh, urban proletariat workers. So it had to depend on the peasantry, which according to Marxist orthodoxy is like a no-no, right? And he was criticized by many members of the uh, early Communist Party of China for having such beliefs. So his ideas, um, his contribution is to continually adapt and, and you take a look at his approach to warfare, right? He said, okay, when the Red Army was young, the Chinese Red Army was young, and it was undergone and outnumbered, it would have to depend on guerrilla warfare. As it grew stronger, it would move to what he called mobile warfare. And finally, when it had the strength to take on uh, the Kuomintang, um, the reactionary forces, it would engage in conventional warfare, right? So his ideas are you have to adapt to the circumstances that you have right now, or else you can't just blindly go down this path, right? I mean, it, 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 it's, you talked about idealism versus materialism, right? Mao was a materialist. Believe, hey, this is the condition, we're, this is the material condition we have to deal with right now. So we have to craft our policies and our ideas to fit that condition in order for it to work. We can't just have some ideas in our head about some ideal, you know, society and then try to fit our policies to make that work. You gotta make your, you gotta have your ideas work based on what you have in the real world, right? And I think, you know, a lot of Maoists, um, they idealize Mao, right? They idealize what he believed uh, in like the final decades of his life, which are probably, probably not the best decades of his life, especially the Cultural Revolution, which was hugely disruptive. Uh, and the Communist Party of China says as much these days. Um, so, you know, to, to idealize that is to really not really understand what Mao stood for, right? If you go and read his selected works, you will understand, yeah, his primary concern was how to apply Marxism to Chinese circumstances and use Marxism as a tool to rejuvenate China, to save China from the depredations of capitalism, imperialism, colonialism. Um, and, and in the end of the day, he was a nation builder. Yes, he had to tear down the old, you know, corrupt, what we Chinese call the old society, right? The 
pre-communist China and build a new China. But that was his, you know, that he was a builder. He was not a vandal, right? He had to be a little bit of a vandal to take out what was what was there before. But at the end of the day, you know, the institutions that he ultimately set up are still with China today, and that's that's his that's his contribution, you know. And I would say, um, you know, what we have is Maoist, or what they call, you know, what they call themselves Maoist these days. I mean, they're stuck, right? They're stuck in that one particular period of time, right? The Cultural Revolution, the 60s and the 70s in China. And it's like, how is that going to help you? That was something that, that happened in China in that particular time period, and it wasn't even that great for China. So how is it going to be great for for Americans or Europeans or you know Africans or whatever, right? Like y you got to find something that works, um, and and uh, you know obviously that's you can't be just stuck on this one particular period in history. Yeah. Uh, actually, in, in the back, yeah, yeah, yeah. you raise your hand first. Well, I wanted to say. Um Thank you for the um, lecture. It was very nice. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I had a question. I wanted your opinion on um, a certain type of um, intellectual, where they say um, a nation's success is based on entirely on its um, geography. You know what happens because the reason I bring it up is because there are um, nowadays um, a lot of um, mainstream academic ideas are being propagated into like the um, pop science and pop um, culture understanding type of things. And so there, there'll be videos on China, I'll see. And they'll say, oh, China has just been growing because it has um, rare earth metals or because um, its geography is really good. And they'll say um, it has absolutely nothing to do with um, the socialism. It's just the geography, and the geography is going to limit the country forever. You know, it's surrounded by enemies. It will never, like, rise up any higher than it is right now. So I wanted to know, like, what's your opinion on that? So they're basically saying that China's success is almost entirely because of geography. Yes. I mean, I mean that's just crazy, right? Like, I mean, like. You don't even have to delve that far into Chinese history to see that. I mean, geography doesn't change. It, it the country of China is not moving anywhere. It's not just to like pick up and like move to North America tomorrow, right? It's going to be in that part of Asia forever. But how is it that a hundred years ago China was a, a very very impoverished country that was attacked? Um, brutalized by various uh, imperialist countries, um, and a hundred years later, China is a vastly wealthy and independent and strong country, right? Like the geography didn't change in those hundred years, right? But what did change is that a new ruling party came to power, and they had the right policies, they had the right, um, you know, the, the right leadership. Um, the right ideology to guide China to a much more prosperous state. So, I mean, that it, it, it that just sounds crazy to me, you know? Like, resources, yeah, China has a lot of rare earth metals, and certainly that's important, right? But there are a lot of countries with a lot of resources around the world um, who are very poor still. As a matter of fact, there is a theory in international relations called the resource curse. That actually, the more resources you have uh, underneath the soil, the worse that country is in terms of uh, development. So, I mean, that's just like China owing its success entirely to uh, to geography. That just seems like complete nonsense to me, personally. Yes. So, um, humanity right now is facing. Uh I guess uh, climate change, global warming, everybody's talking about this. Tomorrow there's going to be a, a strike or an international strike by students and uh, uh, there's a, a fear among the youth that, you know, there is no future. 
Um, you know, and all the signs are there. there. The scientists even confirm that a couple of degrees is, is going to basically destroy life on Earth. The species are disappearing, the water is rising, the ice is melting. Um, your presentation is, is about production, it's about, you know, getting everything for everybody. And it's always the, the, the fear that I have when people talk about socialism. They say, well, you know, if they have it, we should have it. And everybody's going to be happy when we're going to have everything. Everybody's going to be rich. I see like a sort of dissonance in this, and maybe you can bring some light into this. How, how is this climate change as this, this end of the world perspective that we get from other sources? How does that intervene in, in, in your uh, presentation, in, in well, what China is doing? Kind of like what Caleb touched upon last week, right? How do we solve climate change? Do we solve it by regressing backwards and like destroying all the productive forces that have been accumulated over centuries uh, through the Industrial Revolution and Information Revolution? Do we go back to like a primitive existence as hunter-gatherers? I mean, we went back to being hunter-gatherers, yeah, like there, we could solve the climate problem tomorrow, right? right. I mean, there'd be zero green, greenhouse emissions. People are gonna go back to, you know, hunting, gathering, and like, you know, living in caves. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have this problem at all, but is that what we want to do? Or, or would we rather, like Caleb said, move forward, find a scientific and a technological way out, right? Find a way where we can completely wean ourselves off of, uh, of, of carbon, right? Uh, from fossil fuel. Find a way to digest plastic and turn it back into, uh, you know, turn it back into compostable uh, material, right? Are we gonna find, are we gonna move forward and find scientific solutions, technological solutions for the problems that we have now? Or are we gonna go back to a primitive existence, right? That's the, that's, those are the two choices we have to solve climate change, right? And some, you know, some people in the West uh, want us to go back. I don't think I want to go back. I don't think I want to be like hunting and gathering, you know? I don't, want to, I don't think I want to live in a pre-industrial society, right? Where you got to have like 10 kids because five of them are going to die before they reach adulthood. I don't, think any, I don't think anybody wants to live like that. I think we want to live in a world where we have an abundance of material wealth. But at the same time, uh, find, you know, uh, uh, that material wealth does not come at the price of environmental degradation, right? And it's gonna be, I mean, it's gonna be challenging. It's gonna be difficult. I and mean, I'm not saying it's gonna, it's gonna be easy, but those are the kind of the two choices we have. Do we go back or do we move forward? And I'm sure if, if we try hard enough, if, the, if humanity put, put our collective resources together, right? I think we could wean ourselves off of fossil fuel, no problem. I don't think that's a major challenge. It's just a, I don't think it's a technological challenge. It's a, it's a matter of political will, right? You have very powerful forces in the world who don't want that to happen, right? All these oil companies, their, their um, market valuation is based not just on the stuff they, dug, they dig out of the ground, but the stuff that's already, that's still in the ground. So if you say tomorrow you can't dig stuff out of the ground anymore, their market value, their market cap would just collapse. All these com all these companies would go bankrupt. So they have very strong incentive to keep dig, keep drilling for oil or coal or whatever, right? Um, you know, plastic, right? There's like tons of plastic in the ocean. I mean, okay, yeah, that's a problem. But do we not think that if the world really got together and say we're going to send out like, you know, a thousand ship fleet? Every single, you know, every single day, continuously to clean up the ocean. I, how long do you think that would take? I don't know, probably a couple years at the most to clean up the ocean to get rid of all that plastic, right? There's already technology where um, they're finding that mealworms actually can eat plastic, and like what the, the waste is is organic fertilizer, right? And then, of course, not just going to depend on mealworms. That the real the breakthrough is find out just what kind of chemical process happens within the mealworm uh, 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 metabolism, right? That allows it to digest plastic. And then, you know, carbon. I think the problem is not just 
limiting emissions, but there's a ton, a crap ton of carbon in the atmosphere already. But I'm pretty sure if we really, if we really wanted to do it, we could find a way to capture the carbon dioxide that's already been released and then trap it, store it, put it somewhere, right? Back into the ground or wherever, store it in a way where it's no longer in the atmosphere. Like, these are not crazy ideas. These are things that are entirely possible. It's just that, you know, under capitalism, there's no will, there's no motivation to do any of these things. If, you know, if humanity got together and said, we want to do this, um, and we're going to do it now, I don't think it would take very long to solve these problems. Is China an environmental leader? Uh, it's increasingly become one. It's increasingly become one. It is definitely environmental. I mean, they, they put, they install more solar panels in one year than like the rest of the world combined. They have 100% more than the solar panels than the next closest country. Yeah. They have more electric buses in China than we have buses in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. They have, I think they have more electric buses in Shenzhen alone yeah. than we have. All buses in Shenzhen now. But we still electric. build coal plants yeah, once a week, right? Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, not as much as they used to, because you know it's a trade-off, right? Like, how as Xi Jinping, how are you going to tell the Chinese people, you know what, in the name of environmental protection, you're not going to be able to have electricity, right? Like, he can't tell the Chinese people that. He the the, the movement, the the trajectory is towards more green energy, more renewable energy. And China sets targets itself uh, to reduce emission, and it has already met those targets. But at the same time, it still has to allow for uh, greater material wealth and comfort for its people, right? Like if you are, if, because coal is still the cheapest source of energy. It, it, it still is, you know, despite the advances made with renewables, it's still the cheapest source of energy. So how, how are you gonna tell a rural villager right in some mountain valley in china hey look man in in, in the name of environmentalism uh we're gonna have to cut off your electricity you're not gonna have electricity anymore right i mean can't that's not something the communist party is willing to do it's not they're not going to do that um they're not going to say hey the poorest parts of the, of the population like <laughs> you're shit out of luck like you're not going to be able to enjoy the material comforts of a modern society because we place a greater uh, emphasis on protecting the environment, right? And this is kind of, you know, this is going back to Taoism in, 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 in finding a balance, the yin and the yang, right? Like, how do you balance um, economic growth with environmental protection, right? How do you balance these two? You can't just go too far in one direction and neglect the other, right? Like, when China went too far towards economic growth, uh, at the expense of environmental protection, there was a backlash, and it kind of pulled back in the last several years, in the last you know decade. Um, but then at the same time, if you go too far towards uh, environmental protection and not enough towards economic growth, that also creates uh, problems, right? So you kind of have to find a delicate balance, and that's you know that's finding a balance is is very much in the the Chinese character. Whereas like I think one of the aspects of American society is that we, we love to be extreme, right? Like, if, if there's, like, something that we like, we just go, like, we just take it full steam, right? Like, you know, <clears throat> the, the lesson we learned from the end of the Cold War was, hey, look, capitalism is the best, right? It, it provides the best, um, you know, best material comfort, best standard of living of any economic system known to man. So we're gonna go full steam ahead with capitalism. Well, guess what, we're having a lot of problems because we've gone full steam ahead with capitalism, right? Um, and, you know, Chinese would say, yeah, yeah, I told you so, right? You can't go, like, can't go full steam with, with anything. You gotta find a balance between things that are contradictory, but still, you, you have to find a way to synthesize it. Our, our rental place just ran out of town. All right. <laughs> that concludes. But next week, um, we don't have a class scheduled for next week, but um, next week I was hoping that we could have like kind of an informal social get together. Um, so I was thinking that diner across the street that we often go to, if next week instead of having a class here at seven, we all just met at that diner and hung out, I think that'd be kind of cool. So do yeah. people want to do that? 
have an informal Thursday night social and figure out what our next class will be. Yeah, yeah. Next week's also the big week at the UN, so I'm going to be very busy next week. <laughs>